Hey everyone, it's V Spirit at the James Beard Foundation here with two of our best gal pals for our uh, Friday Spirited Conversation, where today we'll be talking red, white, and quarantine. So as you know, if you've been on any of the webinars before, this is going to be a real fun, just like casual peer-to-peer -peer conversation. We're going to try to keep it light, you know, being a Friday and being in quarantine and what. Um, if, if anybody on the podcast says something that doesn't resonate for you or isn't legal in your state, like if we talk about to-go cocktails or something like that, please do check and make sure that our suggestions, jokes, and stories fly in your state. Um, and if you hear something that doesn't make sense to you, just move on from it. If you hear something you like, employ it in your daily, uh, daily work. Um, so I want to welcome Victoria and Jordan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, Emily is going to start by sharing how folks who are listening at home can interact with us because we want this to be a real fun kind of like back and forth conversation. Yes, thank you and welcome back. Uh, welcome to this really fun session. We're so excited to have you. Uh, this webinar, like all of our webinars, is being recorded and we will send that out after this program wraps, um, either sometime today or on Monday, so don't worry if you don't see it, we're, we're for sure sending it. Uh, if you want to catch up on any of our past webinar recordings, you can go to jamesbeard.org slash industry dash support dash webinars, and we can send that link out as well. Uh, we're going to save questions for the end, but just submit them as you have them, and we'll send them through and make sure that V gets them to uh, ask to Jordan and Victoria. Uh, and you can do that using the GoToWebinar control panel. And if you're having any kinds of technical difficulties, just send us a message using either the questions function or the chat function, and we will help you troubleshoot that. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Emily. So I want to get started for the folks who are tuning in who aren't aware of the amazing accomplishments that you guys have both achieved for being so young. Um, Victoria, maybe you start and just tell us a little bit about you, what you've been up to. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so my name is Victoria James. I'm the partner and beverage director here at Coke Korean Steakhouse, which is a Michelin-starred hot, hot spot rather okay. in the Flatiron uh, in Manhattan. And right now we're doing deliveries. So Tuesday through Saturday, uh, 4 to 8.30, uh, I'm packing bags full of wine and steaks. It's sort of like a butcher wine shop to go. And that's what I've been up to, as well as I just uh, launched my second book was published uh, called Wine Girl, The Obstacles, Humiliations, and Triumphs of America's Youngest Sommelier. Book plug here, coming through. <laughs> and that launched uh, a month ago, today actually. Uh, so you can pick that up at your local indie bookstore online. Yes, awesome, thank you. And Jordan, tell us a little bit about what you've been you've been up to lately, other than wrangling your adorable children. Yes, a lot of wrangling lately. Uh, yes, all right. So um, most of my focus these days is on Ramona, which is an organic uh, wine spritz. So uh, we just actually we we are about to launch a new flavor in a couple of weeks. Um, but in the meantime, we are just um, ending a week. So this is the very last day that um, anyone who buys Ramona um, off of our website, drinkramona.com, um, and puts in the code drinkramona, uh, we are donating 100% of proceeds to No Kid Hungry. So that started last Friday and is going through the end of of today. Um, so Ramona has really been my focus the last couple of years, although, um, let's see, I guess starting in 2013, I took over as the beverage director of Momofuku and got to do that um, until 2017 when I switched roles a little bit to the director of wine special projects, um, which has been amazing. And I'm just actually winding that down. We're sort of retooling the role. So um, after COVID, it will, it will have a new iteration, but we're putting that on pause um, while the rest restaurants are um yeah we're just we're putting that part on pause for the for the moment um and let's see i'm trying to think of what else yes yeah, so <laughs> lots of little things in the works but but those are those are the main ones yeah and i think i mean we're going to get into this too but how we experience the restaurant community and experience is going to be so different after this that i'm not surprised to hear that although i'm sure knowing you you'll have a, a whole myriad of ways that we're going to rebuild this better I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about both of y'all's first jobs in the hospitality sector, because a lot of people can look at the SOM and the beverage director and be like, that's the coolest job in the restaurant. And like, I'm not going to deny it is one of the most coveted, coolest positions in the restaurant for sure. 
but y'all didn't start there. Tell me about what your journey has been to that place. What was your first job in hospitality? Maybe Jordan start this one. Yeah, of course. Uh, my first job in hospitality uh, was a barista at a coffee shop, and then I switched to a host at a restaurant in, um, oh, look, I have a little Ramona delivery. Ramona, in <laughs> nice. case people don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, let's see here. Um, uh, then I switched to the kitchen actually, and um, or I was a host at WB50 Wiley Dufresne's restaurant, and that was for me the the sort of the turning point where I fell in love with um, with with this um, philosophy that that Wiley made available to everyone who worked in his uh, mm -hmm. restaurants, and he really just prized curiosity and he prized hard hard work, and those those were things that um, I was really um, happy that he put emphasis on because I felt like those were things that I could offer, um, and that led to um, a little bit of writing actually. So I wanted to be a food writer and started to do that at the Denver Post a long time ago, which led to culinary school and then coming back to New York in the kitchen at Danielle, uh, which is how I got into wine because Danielle said, look, you clearly love wine. You, mm -hmm. um, you really should work harvest. So I was working harvest for my vacation that year and then transitioned to busboy uh, at Danielle and, and sort of worked up um, in, those, uh, in those front of house or sort of those dining room positions before transitioning um, over to a, a part-time uh, sommelier job, full-time, it's like part-time server, part-time sommelier at a place called Nick and Tony's and just fell in love with wine uh, then and, and then sort of started um, over at 11 Madison Park on the wine team under John Reagan um and what else oh yeah the court of master sommeliers that was sort of my i think of that as like my my grad school of wine but that wouldn't have been possible without for me at least you know i think it was very valuable to have the experience in all these other roles because it, so much of it is about you know, a service mindset and and john reagan was really extraordinary about that and when you think of you know our role in wine is is service but from a wine standpoint of course offering knowledge but it's not just about how many facts you can memorize it's it's much more about how can you make a guest feel empowered to walk away with an amazing evening through the lens of wine yeah, absolutely. And Victoria, what about you? What was your first job in a restaurant? Yeah, so kind of like Jordan, I worked my way up from the bottom. So uh, I didn't come from a ton of money. And when I was 13 years old, started as a greasy spoon diner waitress underneath the railroad tracks in New Jersey and uh, <laughs> fell in love with the culture of restaurants. I love that you could sort of hide in plain sight and I was sort of escaping a lot of elements from my home life. Mm. And everyone who worked in the restaurant was just, seemed so cool or so fun. It was like this renegade group. And so I always stayed in restaurants as a server throughout high school. And then in college, uh, I had to find a better way to pay for university. I was attending Fordham at the time here at Lincoln Center. And uh, so I started bartending at a small little place on Restaurant Row called the Tomzi and very quickly realized I knew nothing about wine at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I picked up my first wine book, Wine for Dummies, and <laughs> highly <Sorry>. recommend it. <laughs> and uh, from there, I started reading uh, the Wine Bible, then the Wine Atlas, um, and I just kind of fell down this rabbit hole. But I, at the time, I was 19 and I was too young definitely too poor. And I thought the wrong gender for the wine world. And I really didn't feel like I belonged. Uh, so I kept studying. And then when I was 21, uh, became a sommelier after being a seller rat and also working harvest and uh, became certified with the court as well. But, you know, I still kind of felt like I never really fit in. And, you know, I was always either like the only woman in the room. I was definitely the youngest for sure. And so yeah. kind of my mission is to, uh, you know, just like Jordan as well, make the wine world feel less homogenous and more welcome and sort of dispel this notion of uh, the snobby sommelier. Yes, I think that that's something that we're all trying to do now, right? Like this, the whole glossiness of the industry has really been stripped bare by us being able to put humanity back on the plate and seeing how folks are dealing with things, you know, the shutdown affected everyone. The coronavirus is affecting everyone. It's leveling everybody's, you know, world right now and how we rebuild it is gonna make such a big difference. I know part of what you work on, you know, in your spare time of like all the other things you do is the Wine Empowered program that helps women and minorities break into the wine field. Tell me about what, what triggered you to um, launch that initiative. 
Yeah, so Wine Empowered is a 501c3 nonprofit that offers tuition-free wine classes to women and minorities in the hospitality industry. And for that very reason, be to kind of have them break into this industry that's notoriously hard to break into and is very much an old boys club. Uh, so I co-founded this organization with two other female sommeliers, Amy Zhou and Cynthia Chang, uh, who are young uh, sommeliers as well that always kind of felt like they never really fit in. Uh, they're especially um, also Chinese as well, and they kind of felt as if not only were they women, but they were also from this minority that was not represented in the wine world. Yeah. And they faced so much criticism. And so we were like, how do we change this? And the key to that, we believe, is education and to create that safe space. So right now we're on a brief break, uh, but we have a group of 23 students that's part of the inaugural class. And hopefully we'll come back together shortly and uh, they'll be our first graduating class. Excellent, and you can check more out about that at wine-empowered.com. Um, something that we started to get down the path of and what I've tried to do with the James Beard Foundation and even these webinars, if you've been on them in the past, is take the scary out of the hospitality industry. You know, you hear things like James Beard or sommelier or Michelin star and you're like, do I belong here? Like, am I going to sound like an idiot? Am I going to pronounce that wrong? Like, what's this person taking my order going to think of me? Or like, what's the person I'm on a date with going to think of me? Or what do I think of me by not knowing anything before I came in this restaurant? When you go up to a table and you're going to be helping a table with wine, or a beverage or anything, what's going on in your head as you're approaching that table? Because folks may see you coming and be like, oh my God, this Psalm, they're gonna oversell me. I don't have the money for this, what do I do? But what's really going through your head? Well, I think uh, for me at least, you know, the, the thing that sort of um, breaks the ice no matter what in, in any language is a smile. So if you are warm and you approach with a smile, and also uh, this is a, I think it's a Bill Clinton quote actually, but we used to talk about it in pre-service a lot. And it, uh, and Bill Clinton attributed his presidency to listening hard and to actually, like if you go in with the intention of listening, both to what words are being used or else to what cues are being given, uh, that is, for me, I've always found that is such a, a powerful way to start a conversation uh, because you are going in with the intention of of serving, of making an evening better. Of you know, maybe this guest wants to learn something about wine, maybe they don't, maybe they know exactly what they want and they're on a date and they want you to stay away. So you picking up on these cues um, and just listening is is always um, I found such a good way of starting the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it, that you guys are there to listen and really help guide someone through the experience and not to judge them or anything that folks may have had you know, preconceived notions on. Victoria, what's going through your head when you're approaching a table? Yeah, um, as Jordan mentioned as well, uh, just really approaching, you know, with love and humility. Um, one, thing's, I think, one thing I think is very important is that, you know, the hospitality world in itself is really uh, you know, it's about love. It's not about logic. Uh, restaurants in themselves are pretty like a, a silly concept, right? Like if you just needed food, you could go to the grocery store and cook yourself a meal. But it's about building a sense of community um, and coming together and bringing people together through wine. And that's what I love to do as a sommelier. And so I wish that all of my guests and customers uh, would not be so frightened by sommeliers or intimidated and they have good reason to be because historically they were snobby and you know could be quite terrible <laughs> um, but <laughs> what i really want to do is find you a fabulous bottle of wine and it can be hard because on our list we have 1200 selections so in 15 seconds i have to determine who you are as a stranger and find you the perfect bottle one out of 1200 so you know, it's the best experience for both guest and sommelier is when we come together both with lots of love and humility and uh, put our heads together and find something that will uh, really make your food taste even better. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of folks out there who work in the wine industry or beverage or restaurant are really having, obviously, to pivot what, they're, what they've been doing. You know, our one-on-one -on -one guest experience has completely changed. Uh, retail has gone through the roof on products that people are maybe a little bit more willing to try. And these restaurants that were so, you know, sort of inaccessible uh, previously, now you can get takeout from them. Like they're getting in your house, they're getting on your table. Jordan, what kind of trends have you seen in the retail space and even in like the sort of innovation of getting on people's tables work? 
Sure. I mean, I think, you know, one of, if there is a silver lining, and I don't want to paint it in that direction, but I think, you right. know, one thing that it often comes out of, of constraints like this are innovation and ingenuity, and you sort of see this creativity burst in the midst of all these new limitations. Um, I think retailers, I've seen retailers start partnering with food companies to deliver, like, a fresh farm box with wine. Um, chefs, a lot of chef friends now are making, like, 50 portions of pasta and the first 50 people to sign up can have a, a delivery on a Saturday or Wednesday. I, I see a lot of that happening, but it, it's not something that um, you know makes me smile in any way. I think one thing that you know is is helpful for consumers, especially wine consumers, is a lot of um, restaurants. Um, that I know of sent back sort of large orders of wine, and then instead of now those distributors are reallocating them to um, to some wine uh, retailers. So a lot of wines that are generally allocated are now not only available but are a better price than normal. So that's that's one thing that um, is a little bit of an upside for for wine lovers out there. Um, but it's it's you know I think it's going to be interesting to see how um how this changes the way that we interact um, going forward and the way that we that we eat and drink and and share our time with one another yeah and talk just a little bit more on that because i'm not sure that everybody understands that there's um like there are some vendors that only or restaurant only labels their wines you can only buy in the restaurants and now they have the opportunity to potentially be buying those from the retail shop um yes. how would you know how would you find that like what would be your oh my advice? goodness that's a great question. I mean, I think one thing that's always good is if you reach out to your your local retailer, they are busy. I know this from experience, but if you can get them on the phone and say, if, if you happen to know, I mean, of course, Instagram is a good way of you know, seeing, seeing bottles, but if there's ever been a, a wine that you've loved that you've taken a picture of on a wine app or that you have a special connection with, or maybe you've just seen it posted a lot, like the Allemand Cournos or uh, Rumier or, you know, Rouleau, Merceau, whatever it might be, I'm naming a bunch of French wines, but there, of course, maybe it's a <laughs> wine company. Um, yeah, it could be a number of things. Whatever it is, if you call your local retailer and say, hey, uh, is there any way I can have some of that? Or do you guys have any of that in stock? Uh, chances are they can get it right now because a lot of distributors that, um, one thing Victoria and I were chatting beforehand, one thing that you know, is, is so worth remembering is like these distributors, one thing we we're talking about is like, do you drink local? Drink local, but also drink imported because all of your local favorite uh, distributors and importers are about to suffer a massive tariff tax that we stopped talking about because COVID happened. But you know, drink the more wine you can drink, um, <laughs> it's, it's it's enjoyable, but it's also a nice way of, of supporting uh, your local businesses all along the food chain. Yeah, absolutely. And Victoria, for the twelve hundred bottles that you have in house right now, potentially. Um, what, what are restaurants doing to secure that asset? You know, if you have these special vintages or these very high priced wines, and now you're sort of facing all of these issues with cash management and payroll and all of this stuff, like what can folks be doing to protect that asset? Yeah, I mean, every restaurant is different right now during this crisis. So, you know, I can speak for us here at Coat. What we're doing is if you go on our website, coenyc.com, uh, you can purchase anything off our wine list for 25% off. Wow. Um, and already pretty low markups. You know, a lot of our markups were close to retail, especially for a lot of like grower champagne. So, you know, instead of, um, you know, I, I think there's a way to also support restaurants by buying your favorite wines. And there's some cool ones, as Jordan mentioned, that maybe before you weren't able to find. Uh, so, you know, you can definitely do that. And any restaurant that is open right now, uh, like Coat, um, you can support by ordering delivery, both food and cocktails and wine. And it's a really great way um, to directly support the community. Uh, here at Coat, our owner, Simon Kim, is sending weekly stipends to all of the team members, even the ones we had to lay off. And so, uh, you know, every single purchase goes directly towards keeping our restaurant afloat. Uh, it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been doing these webinars for a couple of weeks now and everyone 
it's come to a point where no matter where either we were talking to lawyers or the journalists or the wine folks or the beer folks, everyone is saying that there's such a strong eye on how companies are responding right now and what they're doing and just being honest about what they're doing. If you had to furlough your employees, being honest about why and what you're doing for the community. If you can't be one of the places that pops up as a relief kitchen, you know, just like how you're doing, what's going on in your life. And Jordan, you have a great quote, how you do anything is how you do everything. How important is that, especially right now? Oh my gosh. I mean, I think it's it's such a helpful way to live life. You know, if you, because there are going to be days where it's easy to do, you know, to be on your game and then there are going to be days that it's a lot harder. Um, and I think you just remember, right, you know, every step you take, um, everything you do, make sure that you're doing it with pride and with intention and that is an important it's just a habit that I've held you know that I that I really try to adhere to and that I've found helpful throughout my career um, in the phases of my career that have been harder and also you know the ones that are maybe more enjoyable but it's 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 hard we're we're in some crazy 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 times and I think you know, um, trying to to stick to it. for me, it's also like a way of sort of of grounding. It's almost like a, a a meditation mantra where it's like, okay, be present, whatever you're doing, you know, do it well and care and really give yourself, uh, give your all to to whatever it is that you're doing in that day. Um, and and that and that matters. Uh, I think that that really matters. Yeah, people are noticing. I know here at Beard, we have our, you know, three times a week meetings on what's going on. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Claire's two year, uh, Claire, our CEO's two year old daughter, wandered into the Zoom. And we were like, Sasha, what <laughs> advice do you have for us? And she was wearing a full Elsa gown. And she was like, just do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing, which I guess is like from Frozen 2. And I have like held on to that. <laughs> I'm like, I, I love work so with that. You know, you know I, I, I love have a frozen story too. So Henry is four and Henry, we just, now we've made Fridays are now movie nights. It's family movie night. And yeah. we did frozen and then we did frozen too. Anyway, it's so fun because we were, so he, we do like, we build in an hour and a day, a day of Henry mama time. And he wants to usually play some sort of element of pretend. And lately he wants to play Frozen. So uh, there's like a closet and he pretends that those are the gates of Arendelle. And so we like have to play in this closet, but he always gets to be Elsa and <laughs> then he decides who else I am. But I just love that, I, you know, I, as we as we are speaking about the hospitality industry and then being women in, in as part of this community, I love and good for Disney to sort of give children some amazing female heroines where like my four-year-old son wants to be Elsa and I get to be like a snowman. <laughs> I know I feel like we're gonna have like a crop of amazing humans in 10-15 years who like learned from Elsa to do the next good thing and like that's yes, gonna yes. be theirs because like I grew up in the 90s with Mulan and all I heard was like be a man and like then I got this <laughs> no totally yes. different story totally we're off topic. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. but what what's keeping you going, Victoria? Do you have a mantra or, or a song that you're hitting hard right now? Yeah, I think that, um, and this is a quote actually that uh, a mutual friend of Jordan and I's always uh, uses, Raj Parr. Uh, it's a Gandhi quote, and it's um, you know, to find yourself by losing yourself in the service of others. And for me, that's always been my mantra in life. Uh, service is what drives me. Um, it's what, you know, lights my fire. And to have a restaurant empty, except for a bunch of to-go containers, it can be really disheartening. And so for me, what keeps me going is, is connecting uh, with our guests still, uh, fabulous women are, webinars like this, but also through um, social media and uh, you know, encouraging our guests to share their dining experience also online. And uh, I think that right now can be a scary time for so many people. And the more that we can keep that sense of community alive uh, is what's so important to me. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we've touched on it a couple of times now that women have made such strides in the last several years towards equity, parity, respect, environments, like what our non-negotiables are gonna be, all of this kind of stuff. And then as this is going on, you know, you, you do see from a lot of the heads or the folks that are getting us seated at the table or the people who are out there with the loudest voice, it is sort of gearing back towards men. How do we keep the strides that we made in parity and keep our voice heard when, you know, the organizations with power right now aren't, other than James Beard Foundation, aren't really women headed? Like, what can we be doing to keep our 
keep our place? What good questions. I think keeping the conversation going, I think that's such a key part of it. And I think, you know, the fact that the conversation has started and it's on people's mind and it's on people's tongues and the beauty of, of quarantine and in the age of smartphones is that everyone is part of the conversation even while we're physically apart. Exhibit A conversation here. I actually, and I, I book the webinars and I, like the other day, I was like, oh, I've only had four men in five weeks. I should really like get, I, I'm the head of women's programs. I'm like, all I know are women. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, also to Jordan's point, you know, uh, so women supporting other women is so important. And we need, you know, one of the reasons I felt so passionate about sharing my story in this book, even though it gets really uncomfortable and awkward at times for me sharing these painful memories, was that I know that these experiences were not singular. They were not just my own. They belong to so many women in the industry. And the more we feel comfortable coming forward and saying, hey, listen, you know, you're not alone, sister. Like this same thing happened to me. Let me help you. Um, let me uh, find a way uh, to help, you know, we can build each other's careers. And that's something else with Jordan is so good at. I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but women owned wine companies, like they don't exist really. I mean, there's a few. And so for Jordan to start her own company in the wine world um, and crush it, by the way, her Ramona's delicious and so is Bella's. Um, it's, it's very rare. So we have to support each other uh, and empower others to share their own stories. Absolutely. And as we're building the, you know, while well, we have this downtime and it's essentially a tear down to foundation, it's an opportunity to rebuild in some ways. And I am not saying that anything that's going on now isn't incredibly like fucking terrible. But when we do come out of this and how we set ourselves up and say, these are the new non-negotiables, this is the new foundation, the way that the restaurant or the wine industry worked before really didn't work for the people in it. It worked in service in some cases, but like, what, what do we want for ourselves and for our families and for our staff that's going to be different than the way it was originally built and sort of retrofitted for a new world? Um, what do you all think? uh in terms of positive things that we'll be building better uh over the next couple of months yeah i mean just sort of right off the cuff i think of ownership right like and victoria is a partner at coat when you when we see different voices as part of as either the as part of the leadership structure with actual ownership, I think that matters. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Ramona exists is because I, I get to set the culture there, and it and you know, and that I think matters a lot. And so, you know, Victoria is a partner at Code. I am the owner of Ramona. We get to then define what matters. There was an amazing article, I think it was Forbes, and it was talking about um, it was a it was a hey how very interesting look the five countries countries with the best response to the mm. coronavirus happened to be led by women. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, there was Denmark, there was Iceland, uh, there were a few, uh, there was New Zealand. Um, and th they said, you know, maybe you're thinking, well, sure, because these are smaller countries, but Germany, Germany, right off the bat, there was transparency, there was you know, this, this very different approach, um, instead of sort of hiding behind um, numbers that were hopeful, but not necessarily the reality and, and so I, I thought that was interesting but the, it ended with um this one example of one of the leaders leading press conferences where no adults were allowed it was only children and so the press yeah. conference was only for children uh and children were able to ask whatever questions were on their mind and uh victoria you were mentioning love and it was just this the, her answers were so full of love and so honest and it was just this sort of completely different approach that that would never happen in uh you know in any country that that I've ever um, that I've ever heard of before, and so just sort of the opportunity for ingenuity to uh, to come out when we have new voices in charge, in yeah. in real power positions instead of in um, sort of trophy trophy power positions or positions that sort of are on a pedestal but but without um, without real uh, potential to impact change. Yeah, what about yeah, you, Victoria? I think that, you know, with this pandemic, I mean, it creates so much empathy. And mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned earlier, V, like we're all in this together. Uh, everyone is affected in the whole world. Um, and so after this, I do expect that, 
you know, a lot of things will change, especially in regards to health and how mm -hmm. important that is. I know growing up in restaurants, I remember even one boss told me like, you come to work unless you're missing a limb. Like, yeah, that's it. you don't call out sick. Like that's just not something you do. That was not part of the culture. And if you would, you know, there'd be repercussions. And I think after this pandemic, uh, everyone will have to have a certain level of empathy. It'll be key to running a good and successful business. And hopefully the restaurant world will have a lot of support from amazing organizations like this, and also the government uh, in order to provide those things for our employees uh, like healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of folks that we've been hearing from over the past couple of weeks, one of the key things that we hear over and over and over is I thought I was safer working for a big company, or I thought I was safer, I was more untouchable because I had all this tenure, all this education, and I was with a big company or as a successful restaurant. And what we're seeing is, you know, it didn't make a difference. It sort of came for everyone equally, whether you were the most educated or the, been there the longest or... Um, and a lot of that is why people don't start their own business, right? They're afraid of failure. They're afraid that they won't have sort of the protections of the company. Um, what would your advice be to folks who are now taking this moment to say, why not me? I I'm, think I'm going to be ready to start my own business after this. I, a phrase that's always stuck in my head uh, that was certainly present when I started Ramona is start before you're ready. Um, so start before you're ready. Um, no one, there's never a perfect moment. I can now say that as a mom. Um, I, I was not ready to have children. And I, when I learned I was pregnant, I was, it was too soon. I wasn't ready. I, you know, I had to do these other things first. And there's no, there's no perfect time. It, it, the timing is perfect when you decide, when you decide that, that you're ready or when, you know, I, I guess for me, I, I like sort of paying attention to these, these little signs from the universe. And, um, and, you know, this is a change agent. We are in a moment of change and, and um, I think it's always helpful if you can sort of make that, uh, make that work for you, you know, if you can. It, we're, it, it's crazy for everyone. The world is upside down and uh, this, there's sort of no, no better time than to, uh, than to put a foot forward. And, and if there's something that you've been wanting to do or thinking about doing for a, a while, do it. Now, now everyone's stuck at home and, uh, and, and go for it. This is a, there's no better time than, than the present. Yeah. Um, Victoria, what would you say to folks out there who have a resume that's just full of serving and bartending and maybe they've never had another job before and, and they're looking to get completely out of the industry just for the sake of this. So they're, they're not going to work in a traditional restaurant experience. One, maybe there's not going to be that job available to them. And two, maybe they're ready to sort of move in and give something else a try. How would you write a resume um, that's full of service experience to appeal to a job that's not in the restaurant industry? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, outside of the restaurants, I've worked before in retail, and of course, I've done a fair bit of writing, so I can speak to those experiences. The best thing to do whenever you're entering a new field or a new, you know, arm or leg of a new field is to really enter with humility and want to learn as much as possible. And so if you want to work retail or you want to work on the distribution side or you want to go get into writing uh really figure out who the key players are uh and figure out a way to work your way up from the bottom again you know um i think that uh, a lot of people have asked me uh how do you get into writing uh, writing about wine or um writing nonfiction from this restaurant career uh well you don't just like pitch an idea for a book and then get a book deal that's not the way it works you know uh you know this my second book wine girl it took me five years to write and i had to have a completed manuscript 100 percent done before even shopping it to publishers through my agent so you know it's not as if when this pandemic is over uh this like these magical opportunities will present themselves but i think if anyone wants to do something different something that brings them joy and purpose they can absolutely do it. Um, they just have to work really hard. Um, and there's so many opportunities in wine, not just restaurants. So during this time, it's a great moment to kind of reflect and think what brings me joy. And if working in restaurants does not bring you joy or there's no longevity in it for you personally, then don't do it. Find something else that you know is really great. Um, and I think Jordan can speak more to definitely uh, her experience there too. So what do you think, Jordan? 
Uh, yes, I mean, I think we're at this moment of uh, of a lot of uncertainty, which which also then becomes a, a moment for opportunity. So it, it's it's unclear, right, where this is going to lead. Um, I would say, for me at least, like I've always, you know, with Bellis and then with Ramona, I, if if there's something that you wish existed and it doesn't. Um, you know, especially you all who are listening are people who like nobody's closer to what's available and what isn't than people who are in restaurants, right? You're on the ground every day. You're having these conversations. You're tasting the wines. You're trying, you, you know what the market has and you know what the market is missing. And if there's something that you're dying to, to try or create or you wish existed and it doesn't, then uh, this is, this is, I think, a great opportunity for that. Um, and I mean, to the point of sort of anyone who's looking to to transition out I, th I think you know Victoria makes a, a really great point if, if there's a story that you that you want to tell I mean this is I mean I, I don't write as much these days but when I did I mean, the way it started was you write a writing sample and you send it to a few places and a lot of people say no and somebody says yes and then and then you build on that um, but but you know the thing about working in restaurants and in in this world is you have so many great stories and you've seen so much and you, you, there there's a lot um, there's a lot a lot to do with with that um, both from a sort of um, how do I say this? Both from you know uh, whether it's creating a product, then then now is a great time to start thinking about that. I mean, I Ramona exists really because uh, I had maternity leave, um, and I, yeah. I finally had a space where I wasn't. I, I mean, I my, I wanted you know I, I wanted to be doing something, and I felt like oh my gosh, you know this idea that I've had that I've never been able to really act on. Let me spend some time just you know just researching a bit a bit, and then at the end of uh, at the end of, of a few months, I, I had a, a viable idea with some some leads on production. Um, so I, I think you know, whenever you can't, con what we can't control, what we cannot control are the events around us. What we can control, which I really believe is 90% of it, is our own reaction and our own response. Um, so if, if you know, that's what I try to tell myself and keep in mind um, on tougher days. And it's a, wait a minute, I can I can choose to look at this as an obstacle, or I can choose to look at this as an opportunity and handle it uh, gracefully and look at the look look at the bright side. And what what is it that you know? What what would the dream scenario be? And how can I how can I work backwards to get there? Yeah, and we're talking a little bit about wine journalism and journalism in general and writing. We had a panel uh, the, earlier this week with Jamila Robinson and Kat Kinsman and Steph Ferrari, all editors of big, you know, publications. And they were talking. We were people were asking, "How do I get, you know, my piece on your desk?" And they were like, "Tell us your authentic, real story." Like, if there's one thing that this the shutdowns have done, it's put people in a place, and they're staying in that place. So I can't send a reporter down to learn about what's happening in Boise, Idaho. I can't send a reporter out to learn about anything that's going on anywhere else. So you have more opportunity now than ever to talk about from your place in history, from your seat at whatever table you're at. This is what's happening and this is what we're doing. And they're very open to that because there's no way to travel. There's no way to, to send you know somebody from New York out there to figure it out. So that's even changing. And one thing Kat Kinsman said that I thought was so clever is she's like, I struggle with my own chumpism every single day. Like people who achieve great success still feel like, Am I the guy for this? Like, is this supposed to be me? And so if you have that sort of imposter syndrome, I think folks have called it, or you have that fear or, you know, putting your heart out there about something that you're really passionate about and you're writing down is intimidating, but know that the heart of the people receiving it right now are especially empathetic and hospitable. And like, they want to hear what's happening everywhere else. People are very interested in the true life story and telling about life in your area through the lens of food or through the lens of wine. Don't worry about like going through traditional food criticism or wine criticism, just tell your own story. Um, we're getting a question in, oh, how can a winemaker impress you guys? You've told us how to impress other folks. Like if somebody's trying to get on your list or trying to get um, their product on a shelf, how would that, how can they go about doing that? Oh goodness. I mean, <laughs> it, first of all, what's in the glass, right? But I, I guess, um, you know, what's in the glass and, and the why. For me, the why is always so important. Um, you know, why did you make the decisions that you made? Um, you know, as somebody, as going throughout the wine production process and, you know, visiting a bunch of wineries, you, you see the whole gamut, right? And like, you know, why did you make the decisions you made? And, um, and uh, I, I think that that's, 
the answers to that is how I usually decide to um, to support a wine and to put it on a list or to drink it myself or to post mm -hmm. it on Instagram. It's got to have yeah. the, the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it definitely has to taste good and it definitely has to have a story. Uh, but more importantly too, like when people ask uh, for uh, tasting appointments with me at Coates, um, you know, I ask them how their wine is made. And if they, you know, if they don't feel comfortable sending over a, a text sheet with all of the information, um, whether or not it's farmed sustainably, uh, organic, biodynamic, um, I don't want to even taste the wine. I mean, you know, you have to be honest and forthcoming about the product and the farming practices. And, you know, not everyone might agree with my decisions or my wine list. And, that's okay, but it has to kind of stand for something. And at Goat, I really strongly believe about supporting uh, sustainable farming and organic wines, biodynamic, but also female winemakers um, mm -hmm. and persons of color. And, um, you know, if if your wine doesn't fit in those boxes, uh, you know, I'm sorry, maybe my place isn't for you. Uh, there are tons of other buyers out there. So it's not about impressing someone necessarily. I think it's about having a great product uh, that's made responsibly and finding the correct shelves or lists for that product. Yeah, absolutely, great advice. Can I dovetail onto that? I yeah. just want to add, I can't agree more about the organic farming or biodynamic, but at a bare minimum, I, and it, I know it's hard. I know it's it's an easy thing to say, uh, and it's hard to do depending on what region you're at. But as I try and what I try to do more and more and more is think long term. And it's like there's, you know, when we're talking about grapes or any kind of agriculture that's not farmed organically, it's a bad decision for the planet. It's not the right thing to do for future generations. So I couldn't agree more. And what I consume personally, what I would champion, uh, put on list, serve to my family. Um, it, let's start with organic as a, a sort of a base, a baseline. Do you have any suggestions for folks out there if they're listening while they're in line at the Trader Joe's wine shop or if they're going to the wine shop in their town as to how they can find something um, that's maybe more affordable? Folks are drinking a little bit more now than they used to be. It's not as special occasioning. <laughs> what do you all think is like, what's like a, the sommeliers inside take on a Trader Joe's buy for the average person if they had to, or like a, a sort of more normal priced wine? What would you look for? I, yeah. um, I mean, I would say that, you know, now during quarantine, especially, we're in a really great situation where you can order things online. And I know that the state liquor rules are very strange. So some places don't ship to some places, but in most states, you can find incredible wine from retailers. Jordan and I were talking earlier, like Parcel, like Verve Wine, Convive, Flatiron, Chambers Street, uh, Kermit Lynch in California, which mm. disclaimer my husband works for. <laughs> um, and <I> so. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, there are so many great opportunities. You don't even have to leave your house um, and they'll ship right to you. And the most important thing, honestly, is finding a retailer you trust who can do that homework for you. And you don't have to worry about being the expert in the scenario. I mean, when I need advice about music or art, I certainly don't take it upon myself. I, you know, consult experts because I by no means uh, am an expert in those fields. So, most importantly, um, don't just wander in blind, uh, find an ally. Find an ally, absolutely. Um, speaking of allies, we have another question coming in from Danielle who says she's a student studying hospitality right now with the intention of pursuing a career in the wine and restaurant industry. Do you have any advice for navigating the job market right now? Mm. I don't know that there's much action in the job market right now. I would yeah. say, work on, I mean, no company I know is hiring because everyone's sort of trying to to land right now and figure out, you know, what their game plan is once once things start to open up again. But I would say, you know, use this time um, if you can to really get clarity on what your dream situation looks like and have, you know, you know, sort of, if you know that and, and maybe spend time, time meditating on that a little bit and thinking about what what really is the dream scenario. Um, is it retail? Is it with an importer? Is it on the floor of a restaurant, you think about that and really get your resume in a great spot for that. Um, and maybe think about sort of a few avenues that would work for you. Uh, but I think the more clarity you have on what uh, what really excites you, what what makes you feel 
you know, full of that sort of passion and energy, whatever, whatever it is that fills you up is going to then enable you to, uh, to really thrive in that position once, once the market does open up again. Yeah. yeah and I, and I know that there are some retail wine shops that are quite busy and are looking for part-time help right now. Um, it's not, you know, going, you're not going to walk in there and get like a six figure salary. You know, you're going to be really kind of scraping by, but it's a great learning opportunity. So I would say walk into your local wine shop and say, I'm interested in wine. I know you guys are busy right now. How can I help literally bringing bottles from the shop to people um, on my bike? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there is, if people want it, there is a hustle in there. Uh, it might not be super glamorous, but uh, there's, there's opportunity. Can you all talk a little bit about what working harvest is like and how somebody might apply to work harvest? Sure. Um, all right. Well, I've worked, I think, 12 harvests at this point, uh, and they're all different. But I, I would say I got to work. Uh, most of them have been in France, um, and it started uh, It started because I was willing to, Victoria's point about hustling, um, you know, if you're willing to just do whatever the work is and and, and do the hard work and it's going to be backbreaking and, and that doesn't matter. So be prepared for that and go in um, with the intention of, you know, doing a great job. I think that that was useful for me in sort of getting in the door in uh, my first harvest. And then that led to other opportunities because a lot of winemakers are friends and you you, you do one harvest in one village and then the, the next, you know, your dream winery in the next village is willing to take you on the next year kind of thing. Um, I think it's harder now with visas and that I, I recently heard actually from a winemaker in the Rhone Valley that no one in the US is allowed in France until June. <laughs> I think it's or July. It's a, it's either June or July. Um, but anyway, we're sort of off limits in Europe right now. Um, so I would say, you know, in in the U.S., uh, that might be a good place to start, especially if you work in the restaurant world. Then then chances are you've had a great bottle of wine that you love that maybe you want to work harvest in the far, first place, or maybe you you know a winemaker or two. Um, you know, the first harvest I worked, I I actually was hoping that I was going to work at this other winery and they said no we 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 choose our stagiaires two years in advance but ask my friend and that was how my my first harvest happened so sort of have a game plan but be willing to pivot um and and reach out I mean I think this is a great time to reach out to a few of your favorite spots and um and and see what they say and be willing to yeah I mean whatever you can offer like come from a place of I guess service is, is what we've been talking about all day but um, when you when you come in with the intention of, of helping um, of course you're going to learn as well but but really make sure you're presenting it in a way that uh, the, the winery knows that you you are looking to help and add as much value uh, to their incredibly stressful harvest as you possibly can absolutely Victoria what about you notes on harvest yeah, um, definitely agree with Jordan on all points there. Uh, I think a lot of uh, young people interested in wine ask me, oh, I want to work Harvest. I want to work Harvest at like, you know, DRC or like they name these crazy names. And you're like, OK, well, probably not. Um, I, my first Harvest experience was at a garage, literally in a garage winery. And until you build up that experience and you can show people, you know, here are my references. I worked at this one place harvest and I wasn't just a pest and, and, and in the way and asking, you know, um, thing, asking questions, but not with any follow through. Uh, you need a stable reference uh, because it is helpful to have an extra set of hands, but sometimes it can be also quite hurtful. And it's a high stress situation. Wine can only be made once a year. And this is the, you know, the winemaker's only source of income. So it's a lot of pressure uh, and just to take an outsider in uh, can be uh, a lot riding on that. So work anywhere that will take you the first time, uh, you know, walk into a retail wine shop, have a sommelier friend uh, set that up for you. And then from there, you can kind of build your experience. Yeah, excellent advice. Um, that's, oh, we have one more. Uh, hold on one second. Oh, it's my question. What's on your playlist? <laughs> what are you guys listening to right now? What what TV shows are you escaping to? What podcasts are you listening to? Like, well, how else are you filling your day when not, um, you know, winding it up? 
Oh my goodness. Um, I don't have the most innovative answer here. I've, I've been listening to a lot of Frozen because Henry is really into it. So yes. we, we have a lot of Frozen on our playlist. A lot of, actually, DJ D-Nice. A lot of DJ D-Nice. Oh, yeah. And those are pretty awesome. So if it's not Frozen, it's it's usually uh, hip hop, which my husband loves. And that's sort of the only thing allowed when he's in the room. Um, podcasts. I mean, the, I love the I'll Drink to That podcast that Libby Dalton mm -hmm. does. Um, I love Marie Forleo whenever I'm sort of feeling like I need I need some wind in my sails. I think she's an amazing resource. And she just has, you know, sometimes they're four minutes, sometimes they're 45 minutes, and she has everyone from, yeah, it's more business related. So if you sort of are a business, but also, I mean, entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial, she just has great life advice. Um, yeah, her, her motto is everything is figure outable, which uh, I like to keep in my head as well. Excellent, Jordan. You're doing you're doing the most. I am uh, watching 90 Day Fiance and like the Tiger King and wasting my life away when I'm not planning for these webinars and like fighting the Congress for like the rights of restaurants. We're putting these webinars together. They're really I should I should uh, I should add that I didn't add that because here we all are on it. But I, I love what and you guys have been so active and so powerful during this time, really from the get go. Um, and thank you for all. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Problem with Victoria, phones. what are you listening to? How are you wasting your, your precious time from time to time? Uh, well, being at the restaurant for long <laughs> days and nights is keeping me busy. Yeah. Uh, but in my uh, free time, uh, what brings me joy is reading and writing. So I'm reading a lot. Um, I just read this book called Hidden Valley Road, which was amazing, uh, which is nonfiction. I um, am reading Stephanie Dandler's new book, Stray, which is memoir. And uh, writing, working on a third book so we'll see <laughs> <laughs> very casual taking a very anyone who's also looking to I've, I've taken up sourdough bread baking which is like a nice sort of thing to do with your hands um and a tip is if anyone else is doing that and or wants to jennifer latham is the head of bread at tartine um and she does these instagram tutorials like a nine-step process of you know start with your starter and then all the way through country bread so um it's super approachable super easy she does it like with her children who are these adorable three-year-old twins so if anyone is looking to learn sourdough bread baking Jennifer Latham is a great resource. I love that. Excellent shout out. Women shouting out women. Love it. Love it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both so much for being here with us today and for sharing your journey, your story, your truth, and just giving us an hour to relax and listen to someone else and be in someone else's shoes for a little while. So I appreciate you so much um, joining us. Y'all can find us. We're going to do one more week of webinars for sure every day, and then we'll see what happens. Um, you can find next year, next year, next week's webinars at jamesbeard.org slash relief. On Monday, we have Ecolab and the ACF coming in to talk about upgraded sanitation. Spoiler alert, they're also giving away a code to take their 30-hour food safety and sanitation course for free, so you're going to want to join that. Um, we've got Carrie Diamond and Nace. We're going to be talking about off-premise events and how successful she was able to make Jubilee, which was exciting. We have MoFad. Um, we, we have a great lineup for next week, and I'm just so excited that, um, that y'all are keep joining us and uh, give us this time. We've got Chelly Pingree, and we've got the Lee Initiative, who is like my new best friend, me and Lindsay Alkasic, just like crushing it, trying to feed all the people in the world, right? They're doing incredible work. So check those organizations out. We hope to see you all next week. Victoria and Jordan, thank you again so, so much for being here. Emily, thank you for running the tech from behind the scenes. I would literally die without you. <laughs> thank um, you, Emily. We'll see you all next week. Have a great weekend. Bye, so guys. Much.